Evening, and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Fred Frederic Lavapierre. My name is Jamie Madsen. I'm the marketing and events coordinator here, and I'll be your host for the evening. So just a couple things to note. Uh, keep an eye on your chat box tonight. I will be using it to share details about tonight's title, discount codes, basically all the goodies. So keep that open there. And additionally, the format will feature around 45 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. Please go ahead and submit your questions and comments here. And now I'm really excited to introduce tonight's author, Frederic Lavapierre. Frederic is the former director of education at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and author of Garden Allies, a 10-year series of articles published in Pacific Horticulture Magazine. She currently works as a consultant and serves on the editorial advisory group for the American Public Gardens Association. And she is with us tonight to discuss her latest beautiful title, Garden Allies, the insects, birds, and other animals that keep your garden beautiful and thriving. So welcome, Frederic. We're so excited to have you here. And I am very excited to be here. And so I'm going to share my screen now and um, get this going. Open this. The slideshow. Here we go. Okay. So you should be seeing my title slide here, um, Garden Allies. And I just want to mention a couple things about the photos. If they don't say anything, they're my photos. Um, the others are taken with permission from Creative Commons. And um, the book itself has 150 illustrations in it, uh, actually a little bit more. This right here is an ambush bug. And the illustrator, Craig Latker, is actually a landscape architect and um, artist. And I've been working with him for uh, many years now when I was doing a series of articles. So tonight we are going to talk about garden allies. Many people think garden allies are pollinators, but there's actually a lot more to our garden allies. Decomposers, nutrient facilitators, there's specialized relationships between birds, bats, earthworms. And so we are gonna consider um, all of these. Um, so here we go. So. This entire book is actually based on something called conservation biological control. So um, I am going to throw us like the frog into the pot. Instead of slowly warming up, we are going to jump in and get going right away. And I'm going to give you some science right up front. And then we will have more pretty pictures as we move on. Um, so we, we can live harmoniously in our gardens by using conservation biological control. This is integrated pest management. And I got this chart from UC Davis, um, IPM. And usually when we are thinking about biological control, we are thinking about classical biological control. And I am going to go over these things. IPM in, in and of itself for gardeners isn't the greatest thing because it is really taking into account costs and versus benefits and it was developed for farmers. Um, but as gardeners, we are really interested in our aesthetic uh, benefits. And so how we think about our gardens is a bit different than say how a farmer might think about it. Classical biological control here, we have Charles Valentine Riley. He is the father of modern biological control. <clears throat> and right around the turn of the last century in the late 1800s, the California citrus industry was almost wiped out by this insect that doesn't look like an insect. This is the cotton and cushion scale uh, down near the bottom of your screen. And um, he asked the important question, where did this insect come from? It was sucking the life out of the citrus trees. And he sent a couple people over to Australia where this insect came from and found a couple predators. One was the Vidalia beetle that looks like a lady beetle here. And the other one was a little parasitic fly and he had tremendous success, it was fantastic. Um, and it provided long-term control. He saved the citrus industry in California. 
Later on though, we found out that it's really only effective under specific conditions, uh, one of which is the perennial system. So it works great in orchards um, and it can be quite expensive. And the reason it has become so expensive is that something that Riley wasn't aware of is the risk of host switching. Maybe these Vidalia beetles finish eating this cottony cushion scale, then what are they gonna eat? Um, and so they might eat something that you actually value. And this is especially important when it comes to uh, weeds that we are trying to control with herbivorous insects. We don't want them to switch to something else. So this is something that's not terribly suitable for gardens really. Um, and it can be very expensive. Maybe you have a fantastic oak tree that you need to save. And so in that case, maybe it can work for you. The other thing that we can see is augmentative biological control. And so those ladybugs that you see at the nursery, that's, they are being used really as a biological pesticide, the, the, a living insect pesticide, because no one expects them to stay and they actually are not very effective. Um, and we will talk a little more about ladybugs later. So this is what I love, conservation biological control. You're preserving and enhancing any natural enemies that exist near your garden. Some may be introduced, some may be native. And this is the only approach that really creates a positive feedback loop. There's two major strategies. You're gonna reduce pesticides and you're gonna provide resources. And by doing that, you get uh, you have less of a need to use pesticide because you have more beneficial insects because you're not using pesticides. Um, it really is a fantastic system. It may require a little bit of patience to get established if you're starting out with lawn and you know junipers. And there are a lot of ecosystem benefits to this approach. We are gonna to focus today mainly on pest regulation, a little bit on pollinators, but you can see that there are a lot of other benefits. And the thing that really interested me in writing this book was I wanted to reduce pesticides. Uh, I want people to use less pesticide uh, and we get less runoff then into our watersheds. So why native plants? Um, this is the meadow at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden where I worked for five years and um, it's all native plants there and I became an even bigger fan of native plants during my time there. They support ecosystem health and habitat. On the other hand, I'm not a purist, I'm a gardener and I, I do like to say that if hydrangeas remind you of your grandmother, go ahead and plant some, even if they don't really provide habitat and they're not native. So the reason native plants are so important is this word coevolution. It's a common word now, but it has not been around all that long. Paul Ehrlich and Peter Raven popularized this in the 1960s with their seminal paper um, that was titled Butterflies and Plants, a study in coevolution. But really it was about caterpillars and plants and their close relationship. And what attracted them was that these, um, one, of, one of them is a botanist and the other is an entomologist. And they saw that the insect species were diverging with the plant species and that there was a relationship there. So herbivorous insects, we're gonna talk about them a little bit more. Um, first of all, all life on this planet pretty much relies on plants. Um, plants are what is converting the sun's energy to provide nutrients. And a lot of things are not able to access the nutrients. Think about oak leaves, for instance, unless something else has already broken them down a bit. So herbivorous insects are actually half of all the biodiversity on this planet and 25 to 35% of those insects are herbivorous. And they are converting this plant energy for use by other animals. Either they are being eaten themselves or they're helping in the process of decomposition. 
And what is amazing is that 90% of all these herbivorous insects are specialists. They can only feed on plants that they evolved with. Um, and this essential role in the food web for these plant munching insects is rarely discussed in horticulture. But insects actually are really good at hiding themselves and often hiding the damage that they're doing as well. So maybe you are thinking to yourself, I really don't like insects that much. So maybe you like birds. Um, and it will help if you know that 96% of them are feeding their babies arthropods, just insects, spiders, uh, other associated organisms. 70% of these birds still keep eating arthropods as adults, um, and half of their diet is Lepidoptera. Those are moths and butterflies, insects that are really closely associated with native plants. Um, and birds are providing something like 16, here is 16 trillion dollars of ecosystem services annually um, worldwide in pest control. So we love birds, we love insects. It's all connected. You tug at a thread on the edge and it reverberates throughout the food web. So what we really want to do is promote biodiversity in our gardens, right? A great variety of plants, animals, and other organisms. But what is biodiversity? Well, it's not what we often think of, which is just more species. What that is, is richness. Species richness is the number of species present. The abundance, though, is also really important. How many individuals of each species are present? And furthermore, what are they doing? What is their identity? And what role are they playing? So if you have a lot of different organisms that all say prey on aphids, hummingbirds, lady beetles, uh, lizards sometimes eat aphids. Um, you've got high functional group biodiversity. It means that if one organism, for whatever reason, falls out of your system, there are others there to take its place. And that makes your garden resilient. It's able to reorganize itself following a disturbance. And gardens are always being disturbed. Um, it's, it's what gardeners do, right? We're always out there digging and pruning and, um, and so um, this um, little ladybug pupa is going to emerge soon and um, move into the system. So a lot of factors that promote biodiversity and um, I've listed a few of them here. And it's interesting to note these are all features of gardens. Um, I just want to pull out complexity and space and time here and say that what that means is if I'm choosing flowering plants, say for pollinators, um, I want to make sure that I have them uh, a diversity in space. So things down at ground level, shrubs, trees, and also through time, so through the seasons. Let's talk for a minute about how insects are feeding on plants. And I'd just like to point out that pollinators are actually feeding on plants. They're just not damaging them. And so we love them. And, and some pollinators are making honey and they help us uh, um, have enough food on our table and beautiful flowers in our gardens. And um, let's move on though. This is usually what we're thinking about. Here are some insects feeding on plants. This is a madrone. And um, you can see that the caterpillars that are feeding on the madrone are actually pretty good at hiding themselves. And on the right here is a clarkia. And this clarkia, you can see the little ovals have been taken out. Well, the ovals have been taken out by a leaf cutting bee that is lining its little solitary nest with those bits of flower. And um, so we have to ask ourselves, is that a pest? or is it beneficial? It's damaging the flower and it is at the same time an important pollinator. On the left here, you have a surfeit fly larva and a lot of people think, oh, that looks kind of ugly. I should probably squish it. Um, in fact, it is eating aphids. Um, on the far right is a beautiful little packet made by some kind of little moth and usually people don't even notice these. 
And in the middle here is a spider. It is called a fly. The fly may be a pollinator. It may be a predator. It may be what we think of as beneficial. Um, and then a bird could come along and eat the spider. Is it beneficial? Is it a pest? Well, I, I try not to use these words as much as possible. And I try to think of things in terms of prey and predator and decomposer and their ecological roles. And that is the approach that I take in the book. So now I'm going to go through um, a few little sections. They follow the way that I laid the book out. Um, I start with soil because it is the foundation for everything that we are doing in our gardens. So I will be loosely following the book structure. And I just wanna point out there's a lot of overlap. It's hard to know sometimes where to put an organism into a chapter. It could go in flower visitor, it could go over here in predator. Um, so there's some overlap. And um, soil is by far the most important uh, thing for us to steward in our gardens. Um, the air in which plants are putting their uh, leaves and stems and flowers is a virtual desert compared to soil where roots are seeking anchorage and water and nourishment. And every single surface is teeming with life. So let's take a look at just a few things that we could find in the soil. Um, I always like to point out microscopic life is amazing. And here is another wonderful book, by the way, Life in the Soil, A Guide for Naturalists and Gardeners. Um, I really enjoy it. That's where this uh, drawing came from. And it is hard to imagine that there are this many organisms in one cup of soil, isn't it? Um, but, but there are, and um, I do cover quite a few of those um, in the book, and some of them have odd stories to go with them. Um, then when we think of soil, we usually think of earthworms. Um, this is an earthworm egg, by the way. And um, perhaps you don't know that an earthworm can produce 10 pounds of castings a year. That's basically worm manure. They improve soil structure and drainage. They accelerate decomposition. They create channels for roots, water, air, and nutrients. And they're a big reason why I am a fan of no-till techniques. And then we have the decomposers and nutrient facilitators. Sometimes they're the same thing. These are uh, nitrogen nodules here on a nitrogen fixing plant on the right. And on the left here, we have some moss and some mushrooms and they are decomposing um, this stump. So everything starts out basically as crushed rock. And it is the interactions of these microorganisms and the mineral components and it's fueled by sunlight and chemistry and it breaks down the rock. And after a while, soil develops. So there are a lot of other organisms clearly in our soil and a lot of them are very strange. Actinomyces to macroarthropods, but I want to move along here and talk about flower visitors. And I very specifically did not title this chapter pollinators because we're so focused on pollinators, but actually there are a lot of other insects that are visiting flowers, um, including some that may surprise you. This right here is a helictid bee. It's a solitary bee and it's nectarine on a milkweed. So bees are the most amazing pollinators, right? They have branched hairs. There is an electrostatic charge that they carry and that actually attracts pollen. And they are the only insects to purposefully collect pollen and carry it around. They are by far the best and most important pollinators we have. There's 4,000 species in the US, over 1,600 in California alone. 70% are solitary, about the same percentage are ground nesters, and most are stingless. They're too tiny to bother you. And then sometimes like this uh, group on the left here, they're males and they are not, uh, they don't get into the nest at night. Um, so they have to hang out here. They are on a poppy stem getting ready to sleep for the evening. Um, and so those are sunflower bees there, the longhorn bees. 
with the big antennae. And then if you're familiar with milkweed and how small the flowers are, you will see a very tiny black speck there on the bottom of the milkweed. And um, it, um, they can see, you can see, oh, right here. That is a bee. And that is surprising to people, I think, when they see how small a bee can really be. So I'm gonna move on to moths and butterflies. Butterflies are only about 10% of the Lepidoptera, but they seem more common to us than moths because they're out in the daytime, generally. Um, this is a skipper on the left. You've probably seen them and they do have kind of a skipping sort of motion and American painted lady on the far right. And this is a dusky wing in the middle. Um, and then we have the hunting wasps. So the hunting wasps were included with flower visitors because the adults always visit flowers. They uh, feed on nectar, very occasionally on pollen. And one of the big differences between wasps and bees is that the wasps are feeding their babies um, meat in the form of um, caterpillars, spiders, bugs of various kinds. And um, they are hunters because they, they carry their prey off to their nest after they have caught it, which they frequently do by paral paralyzing it. And this other wasp on the right here is getting a drink of water. And then we have flies and we do think of flies as annoying, but a lot of them are flower visitors and a lot of them are very important um, pollinators. Um, both of these flies have an important role in controlling pests in the garden. The surfeit fly on the right here, also called a hover fly or a flower fly, um, has predaceous larvae. The adults feed on nectar and pollen and the larvae are eating aphids and other annoying uh, small insects in your garden. Um, and the tachinid fly on the left here um, parasitizes other insects. And then I'd like to show you this uh, picture here. This is an Epipactus gigantea. It's the California stream orchid. And it is pollinated by this little surfeit fly here that flies into the flower. And when it does that, it trips a, a, a little trigger and the flower slaps down, uh, the top petal here slaps down and um, lit, it puts these pollinia packets on the surfeit fly, which then flies off to the next orchid. Um, it's a pretty special relationship and um, yet another argument for growing our own native plants. Um, so digging deeper, let's look for a moment at predators and parasites. This is a robber fly, family acility. And the thing that makes it a predator is that during its life, it's going to kill and eat many individuals. Oops. I'm sorry, lost my place there for a moment, excuse me. And so um, let's talk about the um, flies for a difference because I want to talk about what the difference is between a parasite and a parasitoid. Because a parasite lives on or inside its host and it's usually way smaller and it very rarely kills the thing it's living in and it is bound to its host for life generally. But a parasitoid, which is what most insect parasites are um, here, it lives on or inside its host, but only for part of its life cycle. It has a free living adult state and it can be much bigger than its host and almost invariably kills it. And that's key for gardeners. Um, and parasitoids are mostly flies and wasps. Um, this is a bee fly on the right and that is a tachinid fly on the left. And then there are um, the wasps. And wasps, by the way, can parasitize eggs. Some of them parasitize butterfly eggs. There are tiniest little allies. Um, and some of them are parasitizing larvae and some parasitize pupal um, insects. So we're going to meet the beetles now. This is an ornate checkered beetle family, Clarity. 
And um, they're pretty conspicuous. So that's why they call them ornate checkered beetle. They're often brightly colored and they eat a lot of other beetles and other insects. And um, they are being studied right now to see if they can be effective against bark beetles. A lot of these are flower visitors and they do eat pollen and any other in little insects that they might catch along the way. Um, so one of the interesting things about these um, clarid beetles is that they actually, um, the adults prey on the adults and the larvae prey on larvae of the same species. Um, and I just wanna mention beetles really like late summer bloomers like goldenrod and yarrow, um, things that have clusters of small flowers. And they also like early blooming grasses in the spring. They eat pollen and they shelter at the base of the grasses. Well, I said we would get back to lady beetles. Um, yes, you can buy lady beetles, but they don't stick around. And in the book, I go into some of the reasons why we really um, should simply be attracting them to our gardens by growing plants um, that um, have some of the prey that the aphids like. On the right, this is a mealybug destroyer. And that is the adult on top and the larva on the bottom, which you can see is disguised as the mealybug that it eats. It is the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing of the insect world. Soldier beetles are one of my very favorites. They are related to blister beetles and fireflies, and they sometimes get misidentified by people who are using those, you know, good bug, bad bug, uh, easy field guides uh, because of the similarity in appearance. Um, and um, they pupate in the soil and in leaf litter. And it's one of the reasons why you won't really see um, them on lists that farmers have, for instance, of beneficial insects. But they're really easy to build up populations in our gardens. And um, they are fantastic predators, both the adults and the larvae. They attack aphids, caterpillars, they eat grasshopper eggs, mites, and they are reputed to eat cucumber beetle eggs. So I'm a big fan and I have to say, it's been a lot of years since I've had any trouble with cucumber beetles and I have a healthy population of these soldier beetles in my garden. Next, the predaceous ground beetles. So they can actually eat their way in prey daily. And they hunt caterpillars, beetle grubs, grasshoppers, and some of them even hunt snails and slugs. They are nocturnal. They are a uh, hunting predator, and so they move fast. And they are usually dark colored, sometimes really dark, shiny metallic colored. And you usually don't notice them because they're nocturnal. Um, and darkling beetles, which they can resemble, are herbivorous. And like many herbivores, they move more slowly. So in this case, you can tell the difference between darkling beetles and carabids pretty quickly, simply by their behavior. So I included leaf beetles here today. These are klamath weed beetles um, and they're beautiful metallic colors. They attack klamath weed which is a toxic weed of rangelands. And they have been very effective. And so uh, it's important, I think, when we're talking about um, using conservation biological control to realize that oftentimes we're trying to control weeds, not just other insects. And um, well, there's a number of weevils too that are being used. One of them, I think, is being used on star thistle now. Um, and then I have here, the garden commons, familiar garden insects. And um, this is where we put all the insects. We weren't quite sure what, uh, what chapter to put them in. And so they're all here together. True bugs, lace wings, dragonflies, mantises, and some others. And this always brings up for me. What is a bug anyway? I've been using that word. And if you were to talk to an entomologist, they would say, oh, well, a bug is just one kind of insect. Um, and that's true. Bugs have piercing sucking mouth parts. This is a jagged ambush bug. Uh, sometimes you can find them on golden rod. They're quite small. They look like little miniature dinosaurs. And um, you can't really see the sucking mouth part on that one, but you can on these. Um, the one on the right, 
um, which is herbivorous, you can see that it's got this mouth part underneath it. And the one on the left has its mouth part stuck into this insect that it caught. And a lot of the true bugs are red and black. Um, some are predatory, others are herbivorous, but they are all great food sources for a lot of other members of the food web. Um, so how do you tell the difference? And I'm asked this question a lot. How do I tell the difference between a good bug and a bad bug? Sometimes it's just sheer numbers of them. Um, there are usually far fewer predators than there are of the insects that we would like them to prey on. Um, so here is the homopteran groups. This used to be an actual taxonomic group, but through DNA analysis, we have learned that um, these homopteran groups are not actually very closely related. I like to keep them together anyway, because as a gardener, these are our most problematic insects. These are the mealybugs, the scale insects, white flies, aphids, and one thing to know about the homopteran groups is that they are favored food for a lot of other critters out there. Um, now, in this case, this ladybug is on its way to try and eat some aphids and the ant is protecting the aphids from the ladybug and any other insects that come along to eat the aphids because the ant is collecting sugar from the aphids. So oftentimes, if you have an aphid issue, what you really need to do is control ants if you see the ants are there and let all these other organisms come in and do their good work. Um, Odonata are the damselflies and dragonflies. And if you have a water feature anywhere within about a mile of your property, you may see dragonflies buzzing around. They are an unsung hero. They can eat their weight in mosquitoes daily. Um, and I find them as much fun to watch as hummingbirds. So I like to have a, um, I actually have an old cast iron bathtub that is a pond uh, where I can keep these happy. And I like to leave some emergent vegetation there so that the larvae can crawl out and emerge. And then we have the Orthoptera. These are the musicians. And a lot of them are wonderful at disguising themselves. And that's because they are really great food for birds and other animals. Um, the Katie did, this is a nymph on the right here. Um, they are actually omnivores. And so they will eat some aphids and insect eggs and um, generally are not doing a tremendous amount of damage. The grasshoppers, can be a big problem in agricultural areas and in arid desert areas too. And then we have the mantises. And um, I recommend people not be purchasing mantis cases um, because those are usually Chinese mantises and they compete and they eat our native species of mantis. And there are natives. So um, try and encourage them to simply move into your garden and um, avoid buying egg cases. Lace wings, on the other hand, are a fantastic insect to buy if you're a home gardener because they will establish a population and you can buy them as eggs, as larvae or as adults. Um, it can be fun to release the adults into the garden. I've heard of a couple birthday parties um, that do that. And um, the adults, you'll see them on flowers sometimes, but generally they're nocturnal, so they'll be attracted to lights in the evening sometimes. You may not see them a lot, but they are doing some important work. And then the ground crew and beyond. So there's all kinds of organisms here that we are going to skip right over. Snails and slugs, galls, pathogens that I do talk about a lot in the book. And I am just going to talk here about spiders for a moment. This is a jumping spider. Um, I love the jumping spiders. They are um, a lot of fun, even for people who don't love spiders. Um, and the myriapods, this means many footed. Um, on the left is a millipede and you'll see that they have kind of a rounder shape. They move slowly. They are generally speaking decomposers, not doing a lot of damage. On the right is a centipede. It's a hunter and it runs and it runs fast. You may have seen these red ones in your garden and these are babies there. You can see one baby sticking its head out there. 
And um, these are wonderful hunters in the garden. Just don't pick them up and you won't get stung. Yeah. And now we're here on spiders again. This on the left is a turret spider. You probably won't see this in your garden unless you have a little redwood forest or um, some other woods. And this female builds this little nest for herself and doesn't emerge very far. She waits for food to approach. And it's the males that run around uh, looking for females. And this is a crab spider on the right. And sure, it eats pollinators, but uh, it's never terribly abundant. And it is fun to watch them. They, they can disguise themselves. And then we have the vertebrates. Um, and vertebrates make us think of different things about habitat. We need water features, brush piles, rocks, logs. A lot of birds like some thorny vegetation to nest in. Um, this is a bush tits, one of my favorite drawings uh, from the book. So um, amphibians in the garden, um, if you have a, a damp spot, you might have some salamanders. Um, you might be enjoying some chorus frogs at this time of year with the recent rain. And um, reptiles, we have one turtle in California, the Western pond turtle. You're not likely to see it in your garden, but you may very well have these blue belly lizards or skinks or alligator lizards in your garden. And then birds. Um, the birds um, are eating insects and they are just bringing so much joy to the garden. Uh, I have been asked before if, um, you know, wow, your garden has so many birds in it. I thought that you liked insects and you were growing plants for insects. And it's, yes, I am growing plants for insects. And by growing those, I'm growing, um, I'm growing insects for birds. So uh, I'd like to wrap up with a few ideas about what you can do to um, promote this kind of land, oops, this sort of garden where you just are welcoming the whole food web. So you see here a bat house on the left, um, plant natives, um, plant flowers, um, just plant plants. Um, be observant. And um, one of the things that you often see is people will say, well, get a hand lens. A hand lens is, is your best friend. And a hand lens is very useful for a gardener, but I have become a big fan of butterfly binoculars. Uh, there's a couple different brands and um, I can put one in chat when we're done with the presentation. Somebody reminds me. And um, they're not terribly expensive. They'll be $115, $125 or so. And you can sit and comfortably watch butterflies and hummingbirds without frightening them. They're good for watching birds too in your garden. Um, I've really enjoyed them. Visit gardens. Um, and I'm always looking to see what is visiting flowers, because although a lot of other plants are important in developing habitat, of course, flowers are really essential. Um, I like to go, this sign here is at the Davis Arboretum, by the way. So I like to go to botanic gardens and, and um, see what's being visited. I go to nurseries, I go to friends' gardens. Um, it's one of the great things about um, writing about gardens is that I can call people up and say, hi, um, I would love to come and see your garden. Um, so that is a thing that you can do. Um, plant natives, I may have mentioned planting natives. Here's somebody who planted their entire garden um, around this big oak tree that came with the house. Um, and this garden was on the Bringing Back the Natives tour, which is mostly in the East Bay. It is a fantastic tour. It's free to sign up for it. And I highly recommend it. They give you a brochure that you can look up what you're actually interested in. Habitat for bees or a butterfly garden, um, make gardens on slopes, gardens for oak trees. And you can pick and choose which gardens you're going to go and see. Be an example. So I love to see examples in front yards. Um, a lot of people want to go and put habitat gardens in the backyard, but if you put them in your front yard, um, sometimes your neighbors 
are going to um, see what you're doing and they're going to love it. And if they don't love it, there are a lot of organizations now that have signage that you can put into your garden that will help them to understand pollinator habitat or beneficial insect habitat. Um, Xerces Society comes to mind um, and there's various other pollinator groups. And so these are just a couple more examples of, um, you know, having a water feature, um, having uh, drought tolerant plants. Um, on the right, you can see that these um, plants are going to be attracting plenty of hummingbirds. Um, this is a front courtyard here, all native plants. And on the right, you can see an understory in this little orchard um, that has been planted for the pollinators. Here are some master gardeners and they are some of our best examples um, of what we can do. And then I wanted to tell you about iNaturalist. If you are not on it, this is a great way to get your insects um, to uh, um, identify. And um, Bonnie Nickel, who I met through the San Diego California Native Plant Society, is a huge fan. And um, she has posted over 4,000 um, sightings now. And uh, she has had the pleasure, as have a number of amateur entomologists through iNaturalist, of posting something that was out of its normal range. And it was very exciting for her. Um, and she, uh, she did tell me, oh, these aren't my best photos, but it is the sighting that mattered. And her photo had the identifying features um, that it needed. So I would encourage you, if you're not on that, to um, think about um, signing on, if only to get your own insects identified. Um, join or volunteer at your botanic garden, your native plant society, um, or school gardens. Um, turn off the lights. Um, look at how lit up our country is. And um, this is really a, a tough one for a lot of nocturnal insects and nocturnal birds and other organisms. Darksky.org is a fantastic organization. Lots of good information. And uh, of course, um, here's the book. And so um, buy the book. And I always um, do like to tell people to support their local independent bookstore, in this case, Copperfields, one of my favorites. And uh, whenever I'm back in Sebastopol, as I'm not there right now, but when I am in Sebastopol, it is on my list always to go to Copperfields. And um, I find a lot of things there that I don't find other places. Um, and I want to leave you with this quote then, um, that when we tug at a single thing in nature, we find it attached to the rest of the world. And I, I live by this quote in, in my garden. Uh, and so um, I am, uh, ready to take any questions and thank you so much for um, your interest in this book. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Frederic. That was incredibly informative and, and really quite beautiful. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So um, we do have a couple questions. However, we have plenty of time. So if you guys have any questions, okay. comments, feel free to get them in. But uh, Michelle is wondering what kind of insects can one buy to benefit the garden besides ladybird beetles? Hey, um, well, I, I'm a fan of buying lace wings in the home garden. And it, <clears throat> generally speaking, I am not in favor of buying lady beetles. So the ladybugs that you buy at the nursery um, are actually a migratory insect that belongs in the Sierra. And then they're supposed to fly down to the Central Valley and other places and, and uh, um, eat bugs and then they migrate back. Um, and it's one of the reasons they, they don't really do much for us. And why, you know, for me, 
it's been mostly about attracting insects that are in the vicinity. And you will be amazed how many will come even to a, uh, a garden in a city. Um, they're out there and they're looking for a place to live. And so there are, you know, you might have a dozen different species of ladybugs in your garden that you could never buy. Um, most insects aren't available to purchase and they're also, they're expensive to raise. So there is an outfit called Rincon Vitova. And um, sometimes there was a reason to buy, say, parasitic wasps. Maybe you have a heritage oak tree and it's being attacked by something that is really damaging it. Um, and so it might be worth the, you know, $60 to buy this little package of wasps and release them. But um, yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Um, another attendee said, you have so many great ideas. I'm so overwhelmed. What should I do if, if only one thing, what should I do? Um, only one thing, what should you do? Stop using pesticide. Huh. <laughs> that would be my one thing. But my next thing would be plant a native plant, even one, you know, and I think sometimes um, because I live in that world of native plants, people get too um, strident about the ideas like you should plant natives, you know, and um, sometimes it's just a big step to plant just one native, you know. What are some of your favorite native plants? Okay, so well, I'm going to tell you flowers now. Um, okay. Ver Verbena delamina. Um, is a native, well, it's actually native to uh, Baja, California, which is Mexico, and it's uh, one of the islands. Um, but it is a fantastic plant, and it blooms for months and months and months, and it attracts hordes of butterflies and bees and other pollinators. Um, I like yarrow a lot. Yarrow, I'm writing these down. <laughs> yarrow, oh no, and, and now, you know, and now everything's going to fly on my head. Um, all of those Mediterranean herbs that we like to grow um, are largely in the mint family. So things in the mint family, that includes salvia and culinary sage and um, mint, of course, and basil and um, rosemary, thyme. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it's helpful to think in terms of, of just plant families and so um, things in the parsley family are some of the very best plants. They have tiny little flowers and so a lot of the tiny insects that are helping us out that you don't notice, they want that parsley when it flowers attracts a lot of stuff. Cilantro, parsley, dill, um, angelica grows really well in, in, uh, in the North Bay. There's different um, species of native angelicas that you can grow to. Um, chirpal. Did I say dill? Yes, you're so informative. This is so great. I don't like dill, and so I don't <laughs> that's how I feel people. about parsley. I'm like, well, oh. I'll grow it, but I don't know. oh, that's so funny. And so, uh, so you know, so in terms of families, and so that is a really important family, though the parsley family, and then the daisy family, asteraceae. So that's you know, sunflowers. And um, fall asters are great in the fall, and you know German chamomile um, is good, and um, that Monch aster, fr aster, fr I can never pronounce it. It's called Monch this is aster, it. and so you know anything that's kind of a daisy is going to be attractive to, and so a daisy is actually a head of flowers. It's not a single flower. Um, and so think about, um, you know, when you've seen a head of sunflower, uh, a sunflower head. Right. Each seed came from an individual flower. Wow. So next time they, in the spring, well, I guess summer, when you see sunflowers blooming, go and look closely and you'll see that it's a whole head of individual flowers and each petal is a flower too. I had no idea. No, it's pretty cool. That's why we used to call them the composites and um, because they were composite heads. Um, so, okay, so I said parsley, that the rose family is a good one too. And so um, the rose family includes um, a number of plants that are really um, 
good natives to grow. Toyon is a good one. And just like native roses, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, a lot of our fruit trees are in the rose family. And so, um, so you'll see that. And oh, Ramnace, so that's buckthorn family. And so that includes Ceanothus would be the one that most people are familiar with. Ceanothus is a great plant, grows fast. This is incredible. We have no reason not to, to do this. <laughs> right. All these suggestions. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a lot of people think too that um, the that oh native plants and they get all dried up and they you know they don't look good and it is true we have a certain time of year where things look more dried up than others um, but some native plants can look good year round and um, you know manzanita is a great example of a plant that looks good all year long even if it's native uh, and it's going through that dry period. And, but the weird thing is this, like we're used to the fact that when it snows in a place, there's a big break where you're not really seeing plants. And um, we have uh, beautiful plants all winter in California. And then it's in the summer that we have our dormant season. So we do, well, uh, we have another question asking, should we try to let everything go to seed? I do let a lot of things go to seed as much as possible. And <clears throat> I don't entirely agree with this idea that we have for a while that your garden has to be really messy to be good habitat. It actually, it doesn't have to be um, really messy, but it is important certain things like a, a lot of beneficial insects pupate in leaf litter, you know, and um, that place where soil meets leaf litter and there's decomposition happening in that little layer of uh, soil, that's an, that's an important place. And so I try not to rake everything up, right? right. Maybe, maybe you want to rake leaves off a path, but you know, right. those on the compost heap. Um, so thank you so much for that. I know we're getting down to the last few yeah. minutes and I want to, um, you know, ask, well, okay, I'll, just one last question. Is, isn't leaf litter a fire danger? Question mark. Yes. Oh yeah, that is such a good question. I love having people argue about all this <laughs> stuff too. Um, I used to teach a sustainable landscape program and I like to get the bird people and the fire people in the same room because the bird people would tell you, birds like ladders. They wanna land in the tree and come down the shrub and come down and the fire people would be horrified and say, no, no ladders, that's a ladder for fire. And so really useful to get those people in the same room. <laughs> um, to to um, discuss and um, so the answer is not a simple one yes leaf litter can be a fire hazard and you may not want it within 10 feet or so of your house Got it. at the same time it does decompose over the winter and you know trees like oak trees need oak leaf litter it, and so um, you know I think we need to find new ways to um part of it has to do with house hardening you know and i think we probably all saw some of those photos where the houses were all burned down and the trees are fine right so you know um i'm not qualified to completely answer any fire related questions i think it's complicated and it depends on are you living in grassland are you living in coniferous forest are you living in a you know oak woodland it it's different chaparral. They're all different. Interesting. Thanks for that feedback. Um, okay, just to wrap it up, what are you working on next and when can we have you in person? <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sure we could work out an in-person um, in the spring or okay. possibly summer. And then I will bring some collections with me to, I, I have a lot of show and tell, I'm an educator. Um, <clears throat> The next book. Oh, and I did want to mention, I do have a Facebook page that I post on. At some point, there will be a website. I'm not quite done getting that together. Um, and but right now, a Facebook page will be where you can it's just Garden Allies. Um, and um, and the next book is going to be more focused on how to develop habitat. Um, you know, hedgerows and stumperies and um, beetle banks. There's 
insect hotels. Great. Oh, great. That sounds awesome. Well, I have just enjoyed myself this last hour and I'm getting so much feedback thanking us for having you just uh, so everyone's aware. Yes, this is being recorded. Uh, everyone will receive an email tomorrow with a, um, a link to the recording, uh, the discount code, how to purchase tonight's title. I'll include the Facebook page. Oh, and butterfly glasses. You were going. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was going to look those at. up. Um, yeah, or you could even email it to me if you okay. can find it right now. Binoculars. Okay. Here we are. The pen, to pen tax. Oh, I don't want to give you that link, though. Um, how about if I give you this link, which is to B&H Photography, and it will hey. tell you about them. Let me That's see. great. Copy this and put it. Make sure it says everyone. Um, Oops. Darn it. Okay. Now I'm getting confused by all of the windows. Okay, here we are. <laughs> and um, and I'm putting it in chat. Yes, but click down on the blue to everyone. Make sure it says that instead of two panelists. And oh, I see. Okay. To host and panelists to everyone. There you go. There you go. Okay. So. There's actually two different ones. I think that the, the 6.1s, let's um, say 8.5. Yeah, <clears throat> the 8.5s are better if you want to look at birds and insects. And then there's some others that are like 6.1 that are, I use for insects. I'm excited to check that out. Thanks for including that. So oh, that yeah. will also be in the email tomorrow. And um, yeah, Frederic, this has been amazing. Thank you so, Great. so much. Thank you for having me. I had a great time talking to my hometown. Yes, uh, yes. Bookstore. Great. Well, um, happy holidays. I guess we're at that time of year now. Yeah. And um, we'll hope to see you really soon in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Hey, good night.